I heard of a story from the Boston Globe in June 1990 that told of a most unusual wedding banquet ever put on. A woman and her fiancé went to the Hyatt Hotel in downtown Boston and ordered a meal for the wedding banquet. And it was a very big meal. They planned to go all out with it and the bill came out to be $13,000, which is big money in 1990. So after leaving a $6,000 down payment, the couple went home to look through the list of guests to be invited to this event. And the day that the announcements were supposed to hit the mailbox, the groom got cold feet and backed out saying to his fiance, I'm just not sure. It's a big commitment. Let's think about this a little longer. So how do you think she felt? Obviously, she was very upset. She had to go back to the hotel and cancel the banquet. But the events manager said, I'm sorry, the contract is binding. You're only entitled to $1,300 back. So you only have one of two options. You either forfeit or cancel the event, or you go ahead with the banquet. I'm sorry, I really am. So the more she thought about it, the more she liked the idea of going ahead with the party. Not a wedding banquet, but a big blowout party. So not too many people know that 10 years before, this same woman had been living in a homeless shelter. But she got back on her feet, she found a job, and by God's grace, she became a Christian. And now she wanted to treat the outcasts and the poor of society all around Boston to a night out in the town. So in June of 1990, the hotel hosted a party like no other. The invitations were sent to rescue missions and homeless shelters. So that same night, people who were so used to eating out of the trash can were now all of a sudden eating very fancy food. Many of these vagrants and drug addicts who roamed the streets now sipped champagne and had some really nice chocolate wedding cake and danced to a big band all into the night. I want to ask you guys, would you ever do something like this yourself? I mean, it sounds like a pretty big thing, right? A lot of us find this to be very shocking because we rarely see such kindness and hospitality extended to people we consider strangers, especially those who we kind of think of as like the dregs of society, right? Because most of us want to invite family and friends or maybe somebody famous. Wow, look how good they'll make our party, especially if we pay $13,000 for it. But yet 2,000 years ago, Jesus taught us in this parable we're going to be looking at today that this act is actually the greatest act of virtue that anybody could ever display. But then if you think about it, this is pretty much what Jesus displayed when he invited all of these unworthy sinners from all walks of life to come into his family so that they can have eternal life. So this isn't just a display of God's compassion and love, but this is also a display of how powerful the gospel is to save pretty much even the most helpless of sinners out there. And that's what we're going to be looking at in today's message in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 23. So that's where you need to be. So we've been on the gospel of Luke for a long time now, but hopefully as we go through it week by week, you can understand something a little bit new about the gospel, right? Because we know the gospel can be explained so quickly in one minute, but there's just so much depth to the gospel to really appreciate. So last week, remember that Jesus confronted the religious leaders. Oh, you know, this is not new because there was some sort of a Sabbath incident and he had to confront them on their coldness and their legalism to show them why they need to be humble. So this week, Jesus is going to continue to speak to the religious leaders about the way of salvation. So those who think that they're getting into heaven will not end up getting there. 
while those who we did not expect to get into heaven actually find it. And that's actually the main point of today's passage. So today, Jesus teaches us about these two invitation responses in the parable of the Great Supper to show us who gets into heaven and who does not. Very simple. So let's look at the first point together. In the first invitation, the first group, we see the invitation rejected by the self-righteous. We see that in verses 15 to 20. So Jesus makes an invitation to one group and it ends up getting rejected. How sad. Well, let's see what's going on here. Let's look at these verses. So in verse 15, it says, When one of those who are reclining at the table with Jesus heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. So if you guys remember, Jesus was talking about a parable last week, right? And this Pharisee, this Jew, like he uttered this saying, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So basically he was thinking, oh, all us Jews are going to get into heaven. Do you know why? Because Abraham is our ancestor. Because we have the Old Testament. We're following the commandments of God. We're going through these religious rules, even though they're very strict. But, you know, we're all good. Surely all the promises of the Old Testament prophets, it applies to us. We will be dining with God in his future kingdom. See? But now, this is where Jesus will pretty much drop the bombshell. And I don't think they were really expecting this response. So in verse 16 and 17, he says this. A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour... He sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. So Jesus tells in this parable that describes who is going to enter into his banquet. In other words, who's going to enter heaven into eternal life. So in this parable, you know, it seems pretty easy, right? So this man is basically throwing this big dinner party and he extended these invitations to so many people all around who initially accepted this invitation. It's true back then as much as it is right now. To create a feast of this magnitude takes a lot of work and time. Do you guys agree? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So this man didn't really have a set time for when this event was going to happen. He wanted to make sure all the food came out right, everything looked nice before he pretty much told everybody to come. So once this banquet was ready, which could feed so many people, now another invitation was sent out to pretty much invite those who had been invited to come, saying it's ready. So did they come? I mean, usually they're, they're supposed to, but look at what it says here in verse 18. This is where it gets pretty sad, at least for this host. It says, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Wow, these people started to make excuses. This was so shocking. Who would, who would reject such a grand occasion? I mean, what could be so important? Well, the first guy said that, hey, I recently bought some land and, you know, I just got to go check it out and make sure everything's okay. This is a pretty bad excuse. Why didn't he just go after the banquet? You know what I'm saying? So that's why, you know, in Jesus in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, you don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it. Jesus said, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. So Jesus was basically saying, if you love your possessions more than you love me, as in like it's your idol, then you surely will not get into the kingdom of God. That's not true faith right there. But look at these other excuses that people had. Okay, so one guy just kind of turned down the offer. So I'm sure everybody else would kind of get it, right? They'll all be so excited about it. But look what it says in verse 19. An another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. So please consider me excused. What? 
This was urgent? I mean, didn't this guy already test out the oxen before he bought it? Nevertheless, he wanted to be excused from this occasion. So today, that's almost kind of like saying, uh, let's say you had this dinner party, it's your birthday, and don't you love it when you have birthdays so that you can invite so many friends to come to your birthday? Maybe like you went to a restaurant and you had 10 seats reserved at this restaurant that was like your favorite one, and all of them made an excuse saying something like, Oh, I'm so sorry, but I, I recently bought a new car and you know, I just got to go test it out and make sure everything is okay. What would be your thought if you hear something like that? You'll probably say, bro, why didn't you test it out at the dealership? They let you drive around with it a little bit, right? Or maybe afterwards. I think you would be very disheartened by that excuse. But then it gets even sillier. Look at what this other guy says in verse 20. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. Oh, they probably thought this was the funniest one out of all of them because they're thinking, since when did men take orders from their wives or prioritize their needs? You see, back then, women weren't usually held in quite high esteem. So they were kind of, you know, not really that much of a priority. So this was not really a good excuse. So what's the whole lesson behind point number one? It's this. Now I'm going to go into interpretation more in point number two, but it's pretty much, if you think about it, Jesus was making a very sad and serious commentary on why people reject the gospel. Excuses. Because of possessions. Because of relationships. All these things that can really take us away from God. It's very real because I've heard people make these excuses as well. Haven't you heard people say something like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to wait till the end of my life when I'm a senior citizen. I just want to live my life first with my relationships, my money, my jobs, and then I'll think about this Jesus thing later. Have you ever heard people say something like that before? But how do you know they're going to get to senior citizen age? That's why we can never take a day for granted. So these people rejected Jesus, but what about us? So are we also one of these people? Or are we more like this other group, which Jesus talks about right now? And this is the other group we actually want to be a part of because this is the right response. So in the second invitation, which is point number two today and the last point, we see the invitation accepted by the poor in spirit. Thankfully, there's another invitation that went out and this group accepted, but they were a very different kind of group, as you'll see in verse 21. So continuing, it says, And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and lame. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. So did you expect that this man was going to get angry? Yeah, I think so, right? I mean, imagine if you had, a, like I said, a nice dinner party at your house. You wanted all your best friends to come over and, you know, all the food was ready. You had all the decorations up. And how would you feel if none of your friends showed up at your party? Wow, you'd be very heartbroken, right? Imagine how this poor dude felt. He was upset. All this time and energy I spent into creating this lavish feast. And it was so embarrassing that no guests showed up. And he hated all the excuse. So what exactly does he decide to do? He didn't cancel the occasion. Just like that woman I told you in the opening illustration, this is what he decides to do. He decides to go on with the show, but with different guests. So he tells the slave, and yes, a lot of masters had slaves back then, to go out into the public, going to all the poor and the disadvantaged people and the less fortunate people of society to invite them to come to the meal. Mmm, wow. You see, at the time, and I think it's kind of true even today, no rich people really wanted to associate with the poor because the rich will stick with the rich and the poor will stick with the poor. And the thing is, if you invite somebody to your party back then, especially if you're a Pharisee, 
You do it because you're kind of hoping that they can do something back for you, almost like a social favor or maybe even a political favor, depending on who you associate with. So that is why these people were not really so inclined to want to go to this party, even though it's like too good to be true. So the slave went, he really had to compel them, and then a lot of them showed up to the party. So in verse 22, it, the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and there is still room. Wow, so there's still actually more seats to be filled up in this banquet, but the master doesn't stop. He is not content yet. He says this in verse 23. The master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. So he's telling them, go out, bring more people, but this time go even further into the dumps of society. Go out into the highways where all the ho homeless people and the outcasts are. In fact, go look in all the trees and bushes to see if they're hiding or sleeping in there. Yes, if you find them, tell them to come in. You know, of course, like I said, they would not really want to come because, you know, of the whole social distinction issue. So that's why they really had to be, just like the verse says, compelled, the word compelled to come in. No strings attached. Just come and have fun. Enjoy the occasion. So in verse 24, this last verse pretty much wraps up this message that he was telling the Pharisees. He says, for I tell you, None of these men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And that's the ending. Whoa, that's a cr pretty creepy ending, actually, to the Pharisees. So none of the original guests will partake of the banquet, even if some or all of them change their mind all the way at the end. Okay, so now you're thinking, okay, so Pastor Steve, what's the interpretation? What is this whole thing about spiritually? Well, I'm going to tell you right now because we really need to get this point. I'm pretty sure you guys have been entertained with everything I was talking about before this point, but let's really see what Jesus is saying here. So this is a message about salvation that we have to understand. So the master is God who issues the invitation originally to the nation of Israel. So the banquet represents eternal life. So the invitation was originally made to the Jewish people through Moses and the prophet in the Old Testament, and they accepted the invitation on some superficial level. So then when the time has come, God pretty much sent his son, Jesus Christ, to go to them with the invitation so that they can enter into eternal life through Jesus Christ, who's the only way for us to be forgiven. But what happens? These Jewish people, these religious leaders start to make all these excuses before God saying, because of my relationships, because of my possessions, because of, you know, this or that, that I find to be more important that I cannot repent of. That's pretty much what it's about. And you know what happened? God says that you people who I originally brought the invitation to, judgment is coming upon you. And we know this happened, you know, first of all, in AD 70, when God pretty much allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed by the Roman Empire. But then, of course, we know that when they all died in their sins, they stood before God on the day of judgment and they will end up in eternal hell forever, pretty much paying for all of their sins. But then we, you know, we see this other group that was invited into the party. So I think you could kind of guess who this other group is, right? It's pretty much those who have followed what Jesus did, which includes all the people who we thought we would never get into heaven. And I'm not talking about like the homeless person on the street or, you know, like uh, the drug addict, but even criminals sometimes. Those ones who the religious leaders didn't think would get into heaven. Do you know why? Because they follow Jesus' commandment, which is to humble their attitude, turn to a Savior, trust in Him so that they can be made righteous by faith. So before I close out point number two, I want to tell you this so that you don't misunderstand what Jesus is trying to say here. 
This is not to say that Jesus all of a sudden turned away from the Jewish people and now moved on to the Gentiles, as in there's no more chance for Israel. That's not the main point of what he's trying to say here. Also, don't misunderstand G Jesus saying, I pretty much reject all the rich people and I go now towards the poor people. Once again, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Also, don't misunderstand Jesus saying, I'm just going to reject all the religious people just for the heck of it and I'm going to go to all the scums and criminals of society and reward them for their unrighteous behavior. That's not what Jesus is trying to say here. What Jesus was getting at is the attitude in people, which is what saves them. And the reason why all these outcasts were saved was that they've been humbled in their life so that they can be ready to respond to the gospel. Because it's very true, right, that there have been a lot of rich people who have been saved even today, right? And isn't it true that just the opposite. There have, there's also a lot of poor people, a lot of outcasts who end up being condemned because they rejected the gospel. They were proud and self-righteous. So it's not necessarily the people per se, but it's the attitude behind the people. So that is why I read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Remember this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's pretty much it. So just remember this. God does not play favoritism with any specific ethnic group or any specific people. He says everybody is pretty much a sinner headed to hell, but everybody through the gospel has a chance to be saved. What you need to do is not come on your own terms, but basically do as Jesus says, which is to have faith in Jesus and be saved. So that's the whole lesson behind point number two, is that to get into heaven, we need to turn from our sin, which is our attitude towards God, and we need to turn to Christ, believe in him as Lord and Savior, and then God invites us into the banquet. And we know that there is a banquet coming. This isn't just like a story. There really is a banquet coming because Jesus says that when he takes the church up in the rapture, that's really one of the first things we're going to be doing with Jesus is dining with him in that banquet. So there is a real big, a real occasion that's actually coming in the future. So in wrapping this whole thing up, once again, Jesus talks about these two invitation responses to show us how it is possible for good religious people, quote unquote, to get excluded from heaven while the scoundrels of society could end up getting there, which is really mind-boggling to a lot of religious people. But it all really depends, once again, on how you respond to Jesus in this life. So I want to challenge you with this in closing. I don't know what it is that you're trusting in for salvation, but if it's very similar to what the Pharisees have been trusting in 2,000 years ago, or what a lot of these other religions in the world are trusting in, then you're going to be excluded from this banquet. You're going to die in your sin and you're going to be judged. But Jesus says, I can give you my righteousness. That's why I died on the cross to take the wrath of God for your sins. And in return, through your faith, I can impute my righteousness to you. And that is what brings you into heaven. So basically, I want to challenge you with this. If you have not yet turned to God in faith, then today, today is the day of salvation. And I also want to give you this closing exhortation. As a Christian, this is also a very important lesson on evangelism, if you really think about it. So don't think that there are certain types of people that God cannot save where you say, well, I'm just never going to reach them. I'm not going to talk to them. I dislike this group of people. Because God says that he can save even the lowliest and hopeless of sinners. So let's be like Christ and reach out to them with the gospel. Because remember, God is mighty to save. And he is saving sinners every day around the world. 
So let us indeed go out and let's invite them so that they could be part of this big banquet. Because remember, if you're sitting here today and you call yourself a Christian, you were once one of those people. And now through God's mercy, he invited you in and he says, you know what? Go out and invite other people too. Father, we pray to thank you for giving us this very important teaching on how salvation works. And Lord, if we have displayed pride and self-righteousness, today, why don't we humble ourselves in order that we can receive your mercy for salvation and to experience the fullness of your presence at the banquet in the future. Lord, you tell us that we are called to go out and make disciples of all nations. So let's take our mission seriously so that we can tell others about Jesus, so that they can be invited into the banquet. Because when there's still time, there is still hope for everybody. So we pray, Lord, that you will give us a mind to be missional so that we can carry out the Great Commission and do it well for the glory of God, inviting not just the rich and the religious, but also those who are in the highways and byways to come into the banquet. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.